to get a little bit of an inferiority complex. Um, you know, we go to, many of you know that, that the dinner hour for me when I was in politics was sacred. I'm serious. Gene will tell you that in doing my scheduling, 5.30 to 7.15 was DNS, do not schedule. And I'd walk down from the State House at about 5.30, go to Park Street, get the streetcar, go home. Uh, and by the way, there's a lot to be said for governors riding the T. Oh. Somebody said, are you going to talk about the T? How can I not talk about the T? After what you guys went through. Particularly since we were in Los Angeles, where I teach at UCLA in the wintertime, January, February, March. You know, it's a terrible burden, but somebody's got to do it. And we've been doing it for 20 years, but we felt a little guilty this winter. Not too much, but a little guilty. Until the tea collapsed. Then I got really, got, really got mad. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but we go a lot of places together, and it's the usual routine. Kitty, you look fabulous. I mean, you haven't changed a bit since he was governor. And, on, and you don't look bad either, Governor. You know. And the other day, folks, you know, um, our house on Perry Street in Brookline, there's an important Brookline contingent here. Moved out here. Um, is about two miles from Northeastern. So I walk over in the morning and I walk back at night. And as all of you know, um, I can't stand litter, I can't stand graffiti, and I hate these electronic billboards. I can't stand them. Jesus. And, you know, we regulated those things very tightly. So the other day, as, as usual, I left the house and I'm on the riverway. I'm on the riverway. Jesus, I have a pretty strong voice. I was on the riverway. <laughs> walking to work with my plastic bag, picking up litter along the Emerald Neck. Now, you know, there's a lot to be said for picking up litter. Um, I've been on the board of the Emerald Necklace Conservancy ever since it was founded. And you're supposed to leave after two five-year terms, but they decided to make me a trustee for life. Mm -hmm. as an excuse to raise money, and we raised about a quarter of a million bucks for the Conservancy. And um, about two weeks before the big event, it was kind of rainy, I don't know if you remember, in October, November. I picked, I, I, got, I was on my way to work, picked up a piece of paper. It was a 10. 
Ten dollar bill. About four days later, I pick up another one. It's a buck. And a week later, I picked one up, and it's got Ulysses Grant's picture. It's a hundred dollars. Yeah. Now what do you do? What do you do when you face that kind of situation? You leave it there. So I gave it to the Emerald Necklace Conservancy as a gift from an anonymous donor. Okay. So the other day, I'm walking down the riverway in front of Wheelock, okay, and I'm picking up litter, and there's some guy who I would say in his late 50s, not exactly a spring chicken, a little bit overweight, and uh, he recognized me. Now he's governor. I said, fine, tell me who you are. He was teaching the Wheelock, and he even picked up a few pieces of of letter. Now, I wouldn't know Facebook, folks. Hit me between the eyes. I mean, I know, like, what are these kids? Why do they want to? But I start getting these emails at night. Hey, you're on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> and this guy had put the, put the story of our meeting on Facebook. And it started this way. He said, I was walking down the riverway approaching Wheelock, and I saw this elderly man <laughs> picking up litter. I called Kitty, I said, you know, I've been called a lot of things in my life. This is the first time I've been called elderly. This is very distressing. Anyway, look, we're going to be celebrating our 52nd wedding anniversary. Thank you. I'm 81, I can't believe this. I feel like I feel like I'm 31, and this beautiful wife of mine is going to be 79 in December. And, uh, so when I introduce her as the best looking, with all due respect to the rest of you, the best looking Medicare recipient in America. <laughs> anyway, let me just say a few things, and I hope we can open this up and have a good discussion. Um, first, I want to say thanks to you guys and to people like you all over the state. You know I'm obsessive when it comes to precinct-based grassroots organizing. And one of the reasons I lost that presidential race was because I spent too much time talking to people who I thought knew more than I did about how to win the presidency, all of whom poo-pooed this precinct-based stuff, maybe for city council or you know, town council or something, but not for the presidency. It took Barack Obama, folks, not once but twice, to demonstrate conclusively that precinct-based grassroots organizing wins presidential campaigns. And I hope, I hope, I hope we won't forget that in the next 18 months. It's going to be absolutely crucial. More on that in a second, because I'm concerned about this presidency. Um, but you know, today, all of us think Elizabeth's doing a great job, and she is, and she's become, you know, within a matter of, what, a couple, three years, one of the most prominent people in the Senate, I'm very proud of her, and so on and so forth. But that was a very tight race, in case you forgot. And in fact, both Boston newspapers, on the weekend before, I guess it was about four or five days, before the election, published polls. <coughs> one of which said it was a dead heat, and the other which said Brown was a little ahead. So how come she won by eight or nine percentage points? You guys, and I'm serious. I'm serious. Thanks for the compliments on our organizations, and I'm, I agree, you know, I agree with you. I mean, we had great grassroots organizations, and many of you were part of that. But that that Warren campaign was, I thought, it, it were 26,000 people on the street in election day. And some of you were part of that. And not just on election day, this was the culmination of weeks and weeks and weeks of work. And I'll take a little bit, Kitty and I will take a little bit of credit for this, because when we first met her, and I didn't know Elizabeth very well. I knew, knew her by reputation at the Harvard Law School. She had a great reputation with the, with the students, the teacher, and so on and so forth. Um, and we sat her down, and I gave her my little speech about 2,157 precincts, and how you need a precinct captain, and half a dozen block captains, or neighborhood captains, and their job is to make personal contact with every single voting household. You know, you guys have heard this a million times. I'll tell you something about Elizabeth. She listened, sat there with a notebook, taking notes. And she made that commitment. It wasn't easy at the beginning. Some of you remember. Tough getting started up. In fact, I got so concerned that Kitty and I started going out every single summer weekend 
and rallying our troops, some of whom hadn't rung a doorbell in about 15 years, and said, look, you've got to do this. But by September, that organization was cooking. But she would not have won that seat, folks, without the kind of work that so many of you did. And I hope we won't forget that either. That's the difference between us and the other guys. They've got money, tons of it. Disgustingly so these days, thanks to the worst Supreme Court yeah. in my yeah. life. Yeah. And I'm sorry to say that one of them was my classmate at Harvard Law School. And his name was? Antonin Scalia. And you know, even then he was to the right of Marie Antoinette. <laughs> But there was a kind of intellectual honesty of the guy. That's gone. I mean, this guy thinks he's in Congress. This is all about picking sides. And uh, watching him play his stuff during the Bush versus Gore thing, you remember, in the, was, was, was pretty disgraceful. And they're out of control, folks. I mean, they call themselves strict constructionists, right? If it isn't in the Constitution, it's not the law. Where in the Constitution does it say that the money is speech? Show it to me, will you? I've read that thing a thousand times. It doesn't say that. And for those of you who are historians, you'll recall we've been, we've been regulating campaign contributions <coughs> and expenditures in this country since when? Any of you know? Since when? When did we first start doing this? Well, late 19th century, when the railroads practically owned the Congress. Credit Mobilier scandal and all that stuff. That's when we first started regulating and prohibiting corporations from contributing to campaigns, both at the state, at the national level, and at the state level. That's always been part of Massachusetts law ever since the late 19th century. All of a sudden, these guys discover that money is speech. John McCain, who you remember was working with uh, Feingold and Marty Meehan and others on campaign finance reform, was asked about that a few years ago. He said, Senator, do you think money is speech? He said, if that's the law in the United States, then 99% of us, this was long before the 1%, 99% of us are disenfranchised. That's what McCain said. And he's right. The whole point of Regulating campaign contributions and expenditures is to level the playing field. Doesn't mean the, these other guys won't raise more money than we will. But at least it gives us a shot. How many individual contributors do you think Obama had in his first presidential campaign? What do you think? Five million. Average contribution was 110 bucks. But he never had a money problem. Not only that, but if you get those contributors to get out in the street and start working the precincts. And uh, under those circumstances, it was a level playing field. What do you say now about this stuff? These Koch brothers, I mean, pouring, a, what, is it, what are they going to do, 125 million bucks? All because of a terrible, terrible Supreme Court decision. Well, at least for the time being, folks, it means that we just all got to get out there. I mean, and we're going to have to organize every one of the 200,000 precincts in the United States of America. I don't think that's that difficult a job. I mean, we have 320 million people in this country. We ought to be able to get 200,000 people to take a precinct, don't you think? And if Hillary is our nominee, and I think she's probably going to be, and I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. She and her people and all of us have got to make that commitment now, folks. Because to repeat, both in 2008 and 2012, the Obama campaign won. You know, the Romney people thought they were going to win. You know that. Their polls showed that. Same as Scott Brown. What happened? It was people like you in the street that made the difference. Decisively. And we're going to have to do it again. And I'm concerned about this presidential campaign, folks. Um, I like Hillary a lot. I think she'll be a damn good candidate. I think she's going to be the nominee. But she's already being picked apart, in case you've missed it. 
shades of Dukakis in 88, you know? No, and I'm serious. Now, that was my decision. I made the decision, turned out to be the dumbest thing I ever did, that I was not going to respond to the Bush attack campaign. If there's one lesson to be learned from 88, it is you just can't do that. And in case you've forgotten, Bill Clinton, when he ran in 1992, had a small unit in his campaign, about a dozen people, about half of them had worked for me in the 88 campaign. And all they did all day long was anticipate and plan the response to these attacks. In fact, in some cases, the, the response was out before the attack had been made. <laughs> Serious. And in fact, they called themselves the Defense Department, these, these dozen people. And they did an effect. You know, Clinton was attacked every bit as much as, as I was by Bush. The difference was everybody had learned from my demise, and he had that. Now, you know, tomorrow I'm going to email Hillary's campaign manager and say, you need a Defense Department in a hurry. I mean, private emails. Are you kidding me, folks? There isn't a single official in Washington, on Beacon Hill, or in city and town halls that doesn't have a private email. How do I know that? Because I use them. I mean, you know, the other day I wanted to get a hold of the Secretary of Energy. It happens to be a guy named Ernie Moniz from MIT and Fall River, Massachusetts. Portuguese-American kid, went to Durfee, MIT's brilliant, and by the way, played a hugely important role in these Iranian negotiations. He was right next to the president. You know, a lot of this was technical stuff. Moniz was right there. And by the way, his counterpart on the other side, the Iranian expert, also a PhD from MIT, and they were, they were getting their PhDs at the same time. Think about that. I mean, if this, if this agreement works, you can thank those two guys educated over there on the other side of the Charles River. But um, she's got to get a defense department in a hurry. So I want to I want to communicate with Ernie Moniz, not about Iran. Small matter. Um, we've got a cousin by marriage who's doing some very interesting stuff in energy, and I want him to know about it and see if he could bring this guy in and so forth. I was at UCLA at the time, so I walked out in the hall to the office of a guy named Al Carnesale, who, in case you've forgotten, <laughs> was at Harvard for many years, was the provost. Then he became the chancellor at UCLA. And he was my expert when we were fighting Seabrook. <laughs> Al was the guy that was advising me. And he's an old friend. I walked down the hall. I said, how do I get a hold of Ernie Moniz? He said, give me five minutes. And he came back with a piece of paper with Moniz's private email <laughs> and his private cell phone. Amazing. I mean, this is crazy. But when the attacks began, folks, I didn't hear anybody. Nobody said to me and... 50 other people, get up and tell the American people that this is, this is hokum. I mean, you can't negotiate with Iran in the middle of Times Square, folks. I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. And I've got all these private emails, and I use them. Don't try to abuse them. I mean, when I wanted to get a hold of Deval, I had his private email. And I'd email him, he'd be back to me in two or three hours. And I might use it three or four times a year, but the notion that there's something wrong with Hillary Clinton or anyone else, you know, Kerry, you think he's got a private email? Probably has seven of them. <laughs> Turns out Jeb Bush had two of them when he was governor. But see, that was two weeks later. And it's already hurting her. This is already hurting her. So, you know, we've got some things to do. But the most important thing all of us can do is to Get out there and put together the same kind of precinct-based grassroots organization that you guys did for me, that you did for Elizabeth, that you did for Deval, who also got my little speech when he came out to UCLA to tell me he wanted to run for president. I said, you're not even an elected town meeting, man I mean, for governor. I, I said, you, you haven't even been elected to town meeting in Milton. How the hell are you going to run for <laughs> I, said, I said, this is a true story. I, <laughs> I said, um, why don't you run for attorney general? Remember Tom Riley was, was running for governor? He said, because I want to be governor. Not a bad answer. He said, what do you think I have to do? I said, you get yourself back to Massachusetts, and you start recruiting 2,157 precinct captains. 
Now, he did more than that. He called Phil Johnson. He said, who's the best grassroots guy in the state? Johnson said, get a hold of John Walsh. And he won by 20 percentage points, <laughs> in case you've forgotten that. So uh, I just think we've got a lot of things to do, folks. And the stakes, I don't have to tell you, are very high. They're very high, you know, both here and abroad. Um, you know, I really owe you all an apology. If I had beaten old man Bush, <laughs> you'd have never heard of Bush too, <laughs> right? <laughs> now, we're f now we're facing the prospect of having to deal with Bush three, who, by the way, is no bargain. I debated that guy. Don't ask me how we ended up this way. In 1996, when Clinton was running for the second time, at the University of Tennessee, I representing Clinton and he representing Bob Dole. He's not a bad guy, but he is one of the most profoundly conservative people I have ever met. I mean, you know, I always kind of figured Brahmin Yankees were, you know, you know, Frank Sargent, fairly liberal, you know, this guy's, this guy, this guy. <laughs> He's seven degrees to the right of Marie Antoinette. And, uh, and, and don't let him kid you. I mean, this is not, you know, this, this guy's not even his old man. I mean, I always thought, I thought Bush one was a lousy domestic president. I thought he was a pretty good foreign policy president. Who do you think is surrounding Jeb Bush these days, his advisors? The same damn people that got us into Iraq. These crazy guys. You know, Wolfowitz and who was that? Who was the guy who was the UN ambassador? He's nuts. What's his name? Bolton. Jesus. He's nuts, still nuts. <laughs> so the stakes are very high. And, uh, and we've not only got to do it here, we've got to do the same thing we did. You get in touch with people all over the country, enlist them, ask them if they'll take a precinct. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as that, folks. And if we do that, we're going to be okay. Now, what about the tea? Just a word about the tea. Um, I wasn't here. I don't know exactly what happened. All I can tell you is that in 1978, you'll recall we had a modest storm in 1978. <laughs> Ser service was back on the tee in about 36 hours. And um, I got so concerned that I picked up the phone and I called a guy named David Gunn. Dave Gunn was the chief of operations under Bob Kiley during my first term. Subsequently ran four of the biggest transit systems in North America, and when I got on the Amtrak board, believe me, first thing I did was call Gunn and say, will you be the CEO of this place? And he became the CEO of Amtrak. He's the best CEO Amtrak ever had. In fact, he was so good that the Bushies fired him. I'm serious. Uh, so I called him and I said, look, you guys, I mean, a day and a half we were back in service. In case you've forgotten, folks, you know, I, I banned all automobile traffic, so the only way you could move around was on the T. And thousands of people that had never ridden the T took it. Now, you want to take advantage of that opportunity because these are new riders. If they have a good experience, maybe you get them permanently, right? So I said to Dave, I said, what did you guys do? I mean, how come? He said, um, you really want to know? I said, yeah. He said, well, we did two things. First, we ran the trains 24 hours a day, which you have to do, folks, from the beginning. Otherwise, you get drifting, and that's the end of the ballgame. And secondly, he said, we went out in the street, hired 300 guys, gave them shovels, and told them to start shoveling snow. Real high-tech stuff, right? <laughs> uh, apparently, neither one of those things happened, folks. Now look, the T, sure, it always needs resources. But the MBTA in 1978 was, was so pathetically old. I mean, we hadn't gotten that highway money, the tip gut for us and made it possible for us to put three billion dollars in federal highway money into the T. You know, modernize the stations, acquire commuter rail, all that kind of stuff. And yet, service was back in a hurry. So all I can tell you is um, I don't think we need another board. I'm not a fan of boards. I'm a fan of terrific secretaries of transportation who pick terrific general managers at the T. Unfortunately, I and you had the best Secretary of Transportation this state ever had. There's nobody like Sal Vucci. Absolutely. I mean, where do you find a guy who's the son of an Italian immigrant bricklayer who goes to MIT, two degrees, and he's got political smarts coming out of his ears? And with all due respect to some of my other employees here who were very dedicated, 
Fred Salvucci is the most selfless public <laughs> servant I've ever met. I mean, he, he's extraordinary. But those are the kinds of folks you need if you're going to give this commonwealth the kind of rail and transit system it should have. And um, I don't think another board will do that. Now, I like the new Secretary of Transportation. She was the Deputy Director of, if you'll pardon the expression, the Dukakis Center at Northeastern. Um, but we need a top-notch MBTA general manager. The present acting, the present acting general manager is a very good guy, Fred DePa uh, Frank DePaulo, and by the way, was an excellent highway commissioner. But you need a first-rate general manager who puts together a first-rate team and runs that damn thing, and then gets serious not just about maintaining it, but about investing in it. Um, I guarantee you, before I leave this planet, we're going to connect North and South Station by rail. <laughs> Honest to God. I mean, no, I'm serious. It's, I, mean, I mean, it's embarrassing, isn't it? We're talking about the Olympics. We're talking about, bring, about bringing millions of people up the Northeast Corridor on high-speed rail. We're talking, folks, about high-speed rail from Boston to Montreal. Three hours. What do you think? Three hours. Great, two great cities, right? How are you going to do that with a one-mile hole in the system? <laughs> and you know, our original plan for the Big Dig included a double rail line right down the middle of it. The Reagan people fought us tooth and nail on that thing. And even then, without the rail line, you'll remember, it took a Democratic Senate to override Reagan's veto. Thank God for Terry Sanford. Remember him? He was the deciding vote in that thing. But, um, you know, you can't talk about running the Olympics when you've got <laughs> this, this gap in the middle of the system. It would be like having a red line that stops at South Station and resumes over in Cambridge someplace. It's nuts. <laughs> so there's a lot to do. But um, I personally like the idea of the Olympics just as long as we do it in a way that is cost effective and there's always a reason why we can't do that and make some of those improvements. I like the fact that Marty Walsh is saying, look, 2030, 400th anniversary of Boston, the Olympics gives us an opportunity to decide what kind of a city we want. Um, so lots of exciting stuff. Let me just say one other thing. Um, you know, everybody says to me, have you ever seen it so bad, Washington? And I say, well, have you seen the movie Lincoln? I mean, that was kind of bad. You know? um, most folks, I was about to say young folks, right? You know, don't remember Joe McCarthy. I remember Joe McCarthy. I remember McCarthy. I remember what was going on under McCarthy. But let me tell you a little story. I got out of college in 1955, and I was drafted six weeks later. Went down to the Fargo building with 50 other guys, got on a train, headed for Fort Dix. The second day I was there, I had what passed in those days, maybe some of you had the same experience, for a personnel interview. What was that? It was about five minutes with a personnel specialist, another draftee, right, <laughs> who then would talk to you for five minutes and then give you your MOS, right? And from that point on, you were this, that, or the other thing, and that kind of determined your fate for your two years in the military. And um, my personnel specialist was a guy named Harry Kane III, C-A-I-N. Who was Harry Kane, Jr., his father? Come on, this is a savvy. <laughs> Harry Kane Jr. was a right-wing McCarthyite United States Senator from the state of Washington, who I think Scoop Jackson beat. Nobody remembers Harry Kane Jr.? <laughs> and I had a very good friend, also from Brookline. There were very few of us who went to Swarthmore, you know, down Philadelphia. A guy named John Fine, whose father, Jake Fine, was a renowned surgeon at the Beth Israel Hospital. And Fine had been a member of something called the United World Federalists when he was in high school. The United World Federalists was one of these strong UN groups. One of the strong UN. Nothing the matter with that. And uh, as a result of that, Fine was held in a kind of limbo for months at Fort Dix and threatened with an other than honorable discharge. And I'm aware of this, right? And I'm having my personnel interview, and the guy's name tag is Harry Kane III. <laughs> now, I can't tell you at that time I decided I wanted to run for office, but I, I at least was thinking about the possibility, and I really didn't want to launch my political career 
with an honor of an honorable discharge from the United States Army, right? <laughs> so the guy sitting there, remember this is 1955, right? No computers then, folks. And he's got a file. And he says, um, I see you were pretty active politically on the Swarthmore College campus. And he said, yeah, I was. Ran a fundraising drive for the American Civil Liberties Union. He said, yeah. He said, and you were chairman of the Students for Democratic Action, which was the student wing of the Americans for Democratic Action of those days. Succeeded, by the way, the following year by a guy named Carl Levin, <laughs> who's just stepped down after three terms, and a great guy in the United States Senate from Michigan. So I'm sitting there, folks, and I'm saying to myself, I'm just this Greek kid from Brookline. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell am I doing in a file that has been given to this guy and has this stuff in it? right in the middle of the whole McCarthy. Years later, we discovered that the FBI had a tap on the Swarthmore College switchboard. You think surveillance is kind of new? <laughs> and in those days, no cell phones, needless to say, and no, home, uh, no, no room phones. And if you want to make a phone call, in those days, it went through the switchboard. The FBI was listening in every goddamn telephone call it was made. That's where they got all this stuff. Imagine. So, you know, is it is it bad these days? Yeah, it's frustrating. But not like the McCarthy, not like Vietnam. And by the way, with all of the issues we're facing, including some of this disgraceful stuff uh, in Baltimore and elsewhere, um, this is a much better country, folks, than the one that Kitty and I were born into. Guys weren't around when. I mean, Boston in those days was racist. It was anti-Semitic. Um, Jewish kids were getting beat up on Blue Hill Avenue every day, right <laughs> during the Holocaust, right in World War II. Serious, you know? This was a tough town. It was a divided. Brookline, Brookline, my our town. People of color, folks, couldn't live in the town of Brookline unless they were janitors. We had two families named Gray living in the basement of those apartment buildings. And they always voted for me. You know why? Because I was the only politician that found their basement apartments and knocked on the door and said, hi, I'm Mike Dukakis. I'm running for state representative. I'd like your vote. And those great kids, two of them, worked for me. Both professionals. That was it, with the exception of Roland Hayes, the great <coughs> African-American tenor. People of color <coughs> couldn't live in the town of Brooklyn could live on, you know, the Boston side of the railroad tracks. Is it better these days? It's a hell of a lot better. And don't let anybody tell you that, you know, I hear this stuff about how public education is going to hell in a basket, hand basket, and, you know, it was so great back then. When Kitty and I got out of Brookline High School in the 50s, over half the kids of this country never finished high school. The high school completion rate for black kids in 1940 in the United States was 12%, and most of those kids were going to crappy, segregated schools. When I did the Washington semester program at American University in 1954, when McCarthy was censured, we were in the gallery. Washington, D.C. was as segregated as Johannesburg, South Africa. <coughs> the Washington schools were segregated by act of Congress, and we were running around the world talking about how we were the capital of the free world. So have we come a few miles? Yeah. You're damn right. Why? Because good people got yeah. deeply and actively involved in the political process because they refused to take this any longer. And I think we ought to bear that in mind, even as we, we know that there are issues out there that have to be dealt with. Anyway, so I'm 81. Kitty's 78. We feel 25. <laughs> I feel 25. Do you feel 25? <laughs> 35. 35. We've got eight wonderful grandkids, and uh, tragically, we added another four when our daughter-in-law's sister was killed in an automobile accident, so we've now got 12. Um, Allie, our oldest, is now working for ABC News in Washington on the Bates College. Um, Nico, age 16, is the doubles, tennis doubles champion for high schoolers in the state of Colorado. 
and is working on a paper on the Greek economic crisis. He called me the other day and said, Papu, would you talk to me about this Greek thing? I'm writing this paper. <laughs> but, you know, we're very lucky, folks. We're very lucky, and we're particularly lucky that we have you. Because without you and people like you, I'd have never had the life and the career that I've had, and I don't think Kitty would have had it either. And, um, you know, we're very grateful. And we're still doing it. Um, I was interviewed by a reporter today, and I'll close with this, we'll, we'll open things up. And um, she said, you know, Kitty and you are, st are still at, how long are you gonna do this? <laughs> and I said, well, look, you gotta understand something. Those of us who get into politics do so because we wanna make life better for our fellow citizens. And we do this every day, 15 times a day. <coughs> and we get great personal satisfaction from being able to do it. And what's better than that, folks? So, thanks for having us. Great to be here. And, uh, Okay, so, thanks, thanks, thanks. Sit, okay. and tell me what's on your mind. Yeah. Go ahead. Tunnel, tunnel, tunnel. The, the technology of tunneling these days has come miles. Must be 20 major cities in the world all doing the same thing. Somebody said to me, "Well, why, why do we have separate stations? You know, Paris. For those who've been to Paris, have four. One of them's now a museum. How, what's the answer to that question? And you know, why we have South Station, North Station? Because you had two separate railroads. So the B&M built North Station. New York, New Haven, and Hartford built South Station. That's." why we have these two stations. I have a, re a special legislative commission report from 1910 recommending that the two stations be connected. Think about it, think about it. London, Crossrail Project, 20 miles, 13 underground. Somebody was saying to me, you know, Romney was putting out these estimates about how it would cost $8 billion. That's nonsense, 900 million a mile. And and, and the, additional, the additional revenue would pay for most of it. Um, and I remember when, when somebody was telling me this, I said, look, London is building this thing. Don't tell me that it's gonna be less expensive to tunnel under London than it is under Boston. In fact, I said, they'll probably find Roman ruins. They did, and they also found Richard III. <laughs> That's all part of this underground process. Barcelona, Madrid, Dresden. I mean, they're all building these things. The Chinese, yeah. 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 Kitty and I were in Tokyo for a conference before we came back here, after UCLA. Um, folks, it's embarrassing to spend a week in Japan and come back to the United States of America. The bridges look as if they were painted yesterday. Tokyo has 12 different subway lines, each built under the last one a terrific commuter rail system, and they've just tested their newest train successfully, top speed of 350 miles an hour. That's magma. What are we doing? Spending $300 billion on a supersonic bomber, and nobody can tell you why. I mean, I don't think ISIS is gonna be scared of a supersonic bomber, do you? or another super carrier, what do they do? Put wheels on them and you know, pull them into Syria? I mean, the whole thing is nuts. It's really nuts. But I'll tell you, it's pretty distressing if you care about this stuff to spend a week in Japan and come back here and look at rusting bridges and you know, all this stuff. Anyway, yeah, go ahead. A, a local issue, can you just talk a little bit about the South Coast Rail yeah. It's yeah. proposed to go through Stoughton. People are unhappy. They I'm are? not even sure, honestly, that there'll be the ridership that they're putting their members Don't out. You have a Don't you have a train in Stoughton? Yeah. 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 It stops here. It stops I know that, but I mean, you got it. Don't you want those? 
Look, the single most important investment we can make in what is a chronically depressed part of the state, southeastern Massachusetts, is that train. And it's not going to cost two and a half billion dollars. That's crazy. I mean, there's an existing right of way. You want to turn it into a decent passenger line. I asked one of my best transportation people not too long ago. I said, Joe, couldn't we do South Coast Rail for a billion? He said, that would be very generous. <laughs> now, don't ask me who the people are who are making these estimates. It's really crazy. <coughs> but I think, I think, look, Taunton Fall River New Bedford need <laughs> rail connection to Boston. And we can do it in a way that isn't going to, you know, disturb folks. I know the folks in Easton are unhappy, but, you know, what the hell? I mean, I love Easton. You know, they're part of the Commonwealth, I think, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, uh, but I think, I think we desperately need it, unless you want to put up with Route 24, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, day after day after day. And we really need this, folks. Kitty and I went up to the North Shore for a, an event honoring my former commissioner of food and agriculture, Fred Winthrop, direct descendant of John Winthrop, and a great guy, a wonderful guy, did a fabulous job for me. It took us two hours to drive from Northeastern to Danvers last night. Steady, Kitty started complaining about the traffic. You know, Steve, you said, allow yourself plenty of time. I said, compared to that trip last night, <laughs> this is heaven. Now, one of these days, I think they're going to finish 128, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, close. Maybe. Yeah, but close. Do you but, think um, the ridership that they're estimating will actually come to pass? Yes. Not, uh, see, it's more than ridership. Uh, you, you, you do that rail line and it will dramatically revive the economy of southeastern Massachusetts. I mean, this is an economic development project. It's not just the fact. It, it's a lot of times things are put forward and in the end they spend a well, lot of money and nobody cares. Well, this can be built. It can be built for, you know, a, 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 a fraction of what they're talking about. So hopefully it's happening. Well, um, 1975, I was first elected <laughs> and I went up to to Lowell in February. Um, I knew Lowell because that's where my dad and his family got off the boat and settled. You had to be a person of faith to believe that Lowell could come back. It was so depressed. It was depressed economically. It was depressing psychologically. Half the downtown was empty. So what happened? Well, with the help of Paul Saunders, who was a key guy in this, we went to work, and Lowell today is one of the great examples of urban revitalization. But if it didn't have that rail connection to Boston, it'd be a very different place. And there are folks now living in Lowell, investing in Lowell, companies there, who are there because there is that connection. So there's no question in my mind that that, that rail connection would be uh, is absolutely critical. Look, we should have... People are talking about spending a half a billion dollars on another bridge over the canal. For 60 million, the cost of that damn flyover, which of course doesn't work, we could be down to Hyannis with excellent commuter rail service. Don't you think it's about time we had a train from Hyannis to Boston? Oh, yeah. Have, yeah. have any of you taken the, the, the weekend thing? Yeah. I'll tell you. I I'll tell you. Let me tell you, it's, it's something. Kitty's sister and brother-in-law live down in Pocasset, and they can meet us at the Buzzard Bay Station. Um, I think it was it was a five-mile backup, <laughs> right? And we were just kind of waving to all those cars and just <laughs> zipping down there. But you know, we need rail to Cape. We need rail to Springfield. <laughs> I mean, this this state ought to be completely connected by rail, and we certainly need a connection between North and South Station. So, yeah. lots to do. Yeah. But this, these are very important economic development projects. Yeah? So how much money are they in the Say again? Oh, sorry. I thought you meant Fredor. Do you want me to talk about Amtrak? I want to talk about I know we can, but I Look, um, we've, we've, never, we've never invested seriously in top-notch high-speed rail. We did in the Northeast Corridor, um, and the Acela is pretty good, but it's not 200 miles an hour, because it's on the same right-of-way as commuter rail. 
You go to Japan, you go to France, you go to these places, the high-speed rail is a separate, exclusive right-of-way for that train. Nothing else. There are no freight trains, there are no commuter trains. <coughs> Bingo. And we can do that, you know, in the Northeast Corridor. And we can do it all over the country. Think if that 300 billion that is now being, I guess, proposed for a new supersonic bomber was poured into a first, no, seriously, poured into a first class high school dress. Think about it. Think about it. Um, now, in the meantime, Amtrak's ridership keeps going up and up and up. People love trains. They love to ride in trains. But um, they're not going to putz along at 70 miles an hour, you know? Not in this day and age. And that's what we're asking them to do, except in the Northeast Corridor. And states are dying for this stuff. Now, Obama began that, remember in his first year, with an $8 billion appropriation, Democratic Congress passed it. As soon as the Republicans took over. Yeah. Now, I don't know, are trains a partisan issue? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> who, was, who was the president who was responsible for the Transcontinental Railroad? This will test you. What do you think? Who was the president who was principally responsible for the Probably fact? Roosevelt. Probably Roosevelt. Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> right in the middle of the Civil War. Lincoln was a railroad lawyer, you know. Right in the middle of the Civil War, he said, we're going ahead with that. Pro in fact, it was in the Republican platform of 1860, committed to a transcontinental railroad. And it transformed the, talk about trans a, a, a rail line transforming the country, folks, you know. It took it took a six month trip into a turned a six month trip into a into a five day train trip. Lincoln was the guy. Even when the you know at the worst times of war, he said we're going ahead with that project, and we got the Transcontinental Railroad. So you know this was always a bipartisan issue. When I was on the Amtrak board, we had strong support from Republicans as well as Democrats. All of a sudden, the Republicans, you know, think the trains are subversive or something. I don't know what. What is with it? You know, it's it's really it's really extraordinary. Yeah. Uh, um, you were talking about the Koch brothers campaign yeah. earlier. Is that Citizens United that the uh, That's the decision. So is there anything we can do to overturn Amend the Constitution. Amend the Constitution. Or yeah, or yeah. maybe to shorten the time, make sure we have a Democrat in the White House for the next eight years yeah. so that as these judges begin to retire, we're going to get good judges. I mean, that's the, fa that's the fastest way to do it, and we ought to be working on both simultaneously. But it's a, it's a dis let me tell you one other decision that's a disgrace, and that was a decision on the Affordable Health Care Act. Now, thanks to Roberts, who came up with this kind of screwball notion that uh, it really was a tax, even though he said it wasn't a tax. The bill itself was approved, but there was one very important part of that bill, folks, that required all states, as a condition for continuing to receive Medicaid money, to expand Medicaid coverage to include low and moderate income working folks. That's the so-called Medicaid expansion. Um, those of you who work with me in administration, I think will agree with me that in the 12 years that I was governor, if Congress didn't at least 12 times mandate an expansion of Medicaid, for which we had to pay 50 percent whether we liked it or not, um, I mean, that was happening regularly. It was expanded to cover pregnant women. It was expanded to cover, you know, whatever. And a lot of the governors didn't like it because, you know, Congress could borrow for their <laughs> for their 50 percent, but we had to tax for it. But nobody ever suggested that Congress couldn't require the states as a condition for continuing to receive federal money to expand Medicaid. This crew, joined by two of the liberals, I can't, I can't understand this, held that that part of the Affordable Care Act was unconstitutionally coercive on the states. And millions Millions of working Americans. By the way, 80 to 85 percent of the people that run insured in this country are working folks and their families. They're not loafing. They're not sitting around. They're not on public assistance. These are working Americans. Millions in those Republican states that have refused to 
adopt Medicaid expansion are not getting the health care they were supposed to get under the Affordable Care Act. Thanks to this court. It's a terrible decision. I mean, it's what happens now? Supposing Congress wants to, what, expand federal aid, aid to education to the states, but says if the states want the, you know, if they want to continue getting federal money, they have to do certain things. Can they go to court and say, well, that's unconstitutionally coercive? I mean, this is nuts. But this was a terrible. Next to Citizens United, this was the other terrible decision. Well, Bush, Bush versus Gore was the, you know, <laughs> was, was the champion of them all. How about one last comment, if you have it, and then we'll relax and enjoy. Shoot. Do you still do 500 sit-ups a day? No. <laughs> <laughs> I do 100, not 500. Not, not 500. I mean, look, and I'm not <laughs> – somebody said, you're still running. I said, no. And by the way, uh, she won't mind if I say this because I, I tell her story. You know, Kitty was a, was a freshman in high school when I was a senior. I was a big man on campus. I wasn't interested in freshman women, although I had heard a lot about this Kitty Dixon person from the freshman boys. They were, <laughs> there's a lot of this talk, right? Um, and it was actually my high school girlfriend who years later introduced me to Kitty. And she's a dear friend, needless to say. Um, but I ran a marathon when I was a senior in high school. This was in 1951. It was a record field of 300. <laughs> and I ran that race, folks, along with my buddy, Reed Wiseman. We were both cross-country runners in low-ked sneakers because there was no shoe made at the time. <laughs> I'm serious. To run on hard surfaces. And we also didn't know anything about exercise, science, or any of this kind of stuff. You know, any of you have run cross-country. I mean, high school is two and a half miles, college is four. You certainly don't drink water. <laughs> I mean, you'd never drink water you know, in the middle of a cross-country race. Jeez. <laughs> well, this is 26 miles, 385 yards. And Clarence DeMar was actually ahead of us for four miles, and we were doing a 650 mile. I'm not kidding you. Um, by the time I arrived on Beacon Street in Brookline, I was dying of thirst. And the whole town was out there, the high school, how you doing? Get me water, get me water. In those days, you remember the drugstores had soda fountains? And they kept running into the drugstores and coming out with water for me. <laughs> Kitty says that she handed me a cup of water on Beacon Street in 1951. It wasn't love at first sight, but, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you you want to you, you wanna say something? Come on. Come up here. Come on. You, you've got to hear briefly from this beautiful woman to whom I've been married. <laughs> I just love to tell the story of one of our youngest of 12 grandchildren who lives in San Francisco. And uh, I forget names now. <laughs> I'm going to forget her. It's Nora. Started reading when she was three and a half and composed a piece of music when she was seven for her first Harry piano Harry. recital. So she's got my dad's musical genes. But she also knew that Hillary Clinton was the president of the project that my foundation, foundation that my daughter's foundation. working for. And she came into her, into the kitchen and said to her mother, she was then, she's now 10, she was eight and a half at this time, and said to her mother, I don't want you to work for Hillary. So Kara said, why? She said, because I want to be the first woman president of the <laughs> United States. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to her, Nora, I want you to be president of the United States, but we can't wait that long. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, any other burning questions here? Yeah, go ahead. Anything Mark, go ahead. that you think can be done to end the gridlock in higher education? It's happening a little bit already, in case you've noticed or haven't noticed. It's a little bit. You know, some stuff is, is beginning to happen. And I had an interesting conversation, folks, with a guy named Angus King. I'm a big fan of Angus King's. He's the independent, former governor of Maine, who um, vote is, is in the United States Senate and votes with the Democrats, but is an independent. And, and I know Tom Herman is his brother-in-law, 
right? And Tom Herman worked for me for eight years. Anyway, and he's on armed services. And I was calling him about some regional political thing. And I said, uh, so how's armed services under John McCain? <laughs> McCain's an interesting guy, let me tell you, to say the least. And uh, he said, OK. And so, and, but, but he said, um, and I said, how's it going? He said, well, you know, up here it's very difficult. But he said, there's a second level where you can really work with these guys and get some things done. It's interesting. Kind of under, I don't know how he described it. And, uh, and the other thing he said, very interesting, we haven't talked about foreign policy, but he said, this was about six weeks ago, you remember when there was talk about the United States sending arms, U.S. arms to Ukraine? He said, I'm very concerned about this. He said, why don't we just tell the Russians that we won't expand NATO up to their borders? Why don't we tell the Russians we won't expand? What the hell is the point of NATO expansion anyway? What are we doing here? Finland isn't a me member of NATO. Got good relations with the Russians. They got good relations. What is this stuff, folks? You know, I mean, it's this Cold War. We can't get out of this Cold War mentality. You know, China's the new enemy. When did that happen? When did that? Ninety percent of what we buy seems to come from China, right? They bought billions of our bonds. We got a, we got a quarter of a million Chinese students going to school in the United States. And a million Chinese tourists. When did they become the enemy? What the hell is this? <laughs> but um, that's going to be a big challenge. How do we, you know, how do we build a world, folks, in which war is ruled out as a means for settling disputes between among countries, and we're closer, <laughs> we're closer to that day than at any time in the history of the world. We really are I'm serious. And I think one of the great challenges, it's one of the reasons why Bush, too, just drove me nuts. I mean, and those people around him. And they're still talking this stuff. You know, they're, I mean, this guy Cotton, who, who organized that letter, right? The only thing it goes to show is that a Harvard, guarantee, a Harvard education guarantees nothing, you know? <laughs> you know, Harvard, Harvard Law School, this guy, what, the, what, is, what is with this guy? I mean, he doesn't want an agreement with Iran? Because we don't get an agreement with Iran, folks, then Iran almost certainly will develop a bomb. And this guy doesn't get it. We're two degrees from Harvard. Don't ask me. So, lots to do out there. But um, I'm very optimistic, folks. I mean, I, you know, after 81 years on this planet, I've seen too much good that's happened not to believe that we can't do more. And I'll tell you one thing, and I'll close with this. These kids I'm teaching these days are fabulous. They are fabulous. Um, they're an inspiration, I want to tell you. And they're very committed to public service. They really want to do it. I mean, a young man came in to see me this afternoon, African-American. He's now at Northeastern Law School. I said to him, Jonathan, I hope you're serious. He's a Boston kid. I said, I hope you're serious about getting involved in politics. He said, I sure am. I said, you want to run for elective office someday? He said, yeah. I said, you and your peers are going to be a great new generation of political leaders. And if I can help, fine. But I mean, that's, there's nothing like this, folks. But these kids are great. They're just wonderful, and they're so appreciative of, of you know, teachers which who, who who will reach out to them and, and encourage them. And of course, that co-op program at Northeastern is terrific. It's absolutely terrific. That school is, any Northeastern graduates here? You know how many applica applicants we had for the freshman class this year? 50,000 applications for 3,000 spots of the freshman class. The highest of any non-public university in America. 3,000 freshmen, 50,000 applications. And these kids are, Terrific. So I'm feeling pretty good about things, notwithstanding gridlock in Washington. And I hope you do too. Anyway, a lot to do between now and the year from November, folks. A lot to do. Thanks. <laughs>